You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast helping water leaders to discover solutions and drive change. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This episode is part of a series, The PFAS Puzzle, Lessons from a Contaminated Cape Fear. The forever chemicals were dumped in the North Carolina River for nearly 40 years before being discovered. The series explores how a community responds when it is the epicenter of PFAS pollution. This episode is about the drinking water. The Cape Fear Public Utility Authority in Wilmington, North Carolina, found itself in a difficult situation when high levels of PFAS were discovered in its water. How should the utility manage the forever chemicals, particularly in the absence of drinking water standards, information about health impacts, and a method of removal? In this episode, Ken Waldrop, Executive Director of CFPUA, discusses the lessons learned by the utility. He talks about building a $43 million treatment system for PFAS, pursuing the company responsible for the pollution, and rebuilding public trust in the water coming from the tap. Before starting the interview, I want to mention that Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet. This series is made possible by the support of sponsors Black and Veach. PFAScoms.com, and Ultra. I'll take a few quick minutes to talk about their expertise on PFAS and then start the conversation. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. This episode is sponsored by Ultra. When it comes to PFAS, there are hundreds to thousands of contaminated sites across the U.S. and Canada. Military bases, airports, landfills, and industrial facilities are all known locations where the risk of having PFAS is very high. Ultra experts have been performing risk assessments and implementing cleanup solutions for PFAS for nearly 40 years, building a reputation as innovators along the way. The Ultra team is helping pave the way for better outcomes with proven innovations like its patented PFAS technology and first-of-its-kind continuous process. This drive for innovation, combined with its comprehensive suite of solutions and local regulatory knowledge, means customers have the right team to combat their PFAS challenges. Visit logistech.com forward slash PFAS hyphen solutions. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. This episode is sponsored by Black & Veatch. Black & Veatch is proud to provide the planning, design, and construction services for Cape Fear Public Utility Authority's new granular activated carbon facility that successfully removes PFAS from the Wilmington community's drinking water. Black & Veatch helps organizations across the country and around the world to address their PFAS challenges, providing end-to-end consulting, engineering, and construction services to meet each community's unique needs. From applied research to executed projects, Black & Veatch is at the forefront of innovative and effective PFAS treatment solutions, trusted by key trade and research organizations, such as the American Water Works Association, the Water Environment Federation, and the Society of American Military Engineers, to mitigate the impacts of PFAS in our environment, critical infrastructure, and communities. To learn more, visit bv.com forward slash PFAS. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. This episode is sponsored by PFAScoms.com. PFAS is shaking public confidence in our nation's drinking water. And now that EPA is requiring utilities to test for PFAS, newsmaking findings are guaranteed. Your utility must become and stay the trusted go-to source for information about PFAS in your community. PFAScoms.com is here to help. Their communication experts protect you from threats to your reputation when discoveries are made. PFAScoms.com provides proactive public information plans as well as 24-7 emergency support. Visit PFAScoms.com today to set up your free initial consultation. That's PFAScoms.com. You're in the water loop. I want to talk to you as a utility leader here at Cape Fear Public Utility Authority uh, about how a community, how a utility really responds to being at the epicenter of a PFAS contamination, you know, uh, story. Uh, This is 
really pretty unprecedented what's happened here in, in Wilmington and in the Cape Fear River. Um, you know, you're at the forefront of, of what's happening around the country and the world with, with PFAS. Um, could you talk a little bit about how this happened uh, here in Wilmington in the Cape Fear River for this utility? What's, what's that history? What's that story? To understand the history here in the Cape Fear, you've, you and your audience need to understand a little bit about the history of PFAS in general per and polyfluoroalkylenic substances um, introduced by the chemical industry in the late 40s and 50s, uh, becoming key ingredients in um, nonstick items through the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, think uh, Scotch Guard, think uh, clothing that would uh, uh, dispel water, think Teflon. Uh, these were uh, wide, prevalent commun uh, community use chemicals. And sometime in the early to mid 2000s, it became pretty clear that these legacy PFAS had issues in terms of bioaccumulation, envirotoxicity, um, the prevalence of them. And uh, there was a uh, effort to uh, voluntarily um, move from these legacy chemicals to something else. And that something else was also part of the PFAS family, uh, a reformulation. So when we talk about legacy PFAS, we're thinking long chain uh, connections. And their substitutes and replacements were short or shorter chain. The example that we use a lot here is PFOA. The substitute for that was Gen X. Well, Academia in North Carolina, uh, sometime in the 2012, 2013, 2014 timeframe, started asking the question, what is the prevalence of these new substitute chemicals in the environment? And um, like most water utilities, CFPUA partners with universities and colleges through uh, such uh, wonderful uh, institutes like uh, WRF, right? to understand um, what is impacting the water world. So North Carolina State University researchers reached out to this utility and others and asked for their help. And as part of that research, um, the, the question was not only what's the prevalence in the source water, but what's happening in the water treatment systems themselves. Uh, they're not designed and not, uh, many of these chemicals were unknown to the water treatment operators at that time. Um, so are the treatment processes that we have in place effective in uh, reducing or removing this if it's in the source water? Nobody knew. So in the 2015 timeframe um, and through 2016, the research was began. In late 2016, uh, the researchers had their answer. Uh, this this subfamily of PFOS, uh, represented by this chemical Gen X, was prevalent in uh, CFPUA source water, and it became clear that the treatment processes in place were not reducing or removing it. So it would move through the treatment plant to the finished water to the drinking water. Late 2016 the report was issued. And this is where the regulatory process, the regulatory framework of the Safe Drinking Water Act or the Clean Water Act takes over. Um, utility staff at that time were asking the question, what does this mean? What are these chemicals? What are the sources? Uh, are there any known public health impacts at these concentrations? Um, they were asking themselves, are the testing methods uh, valid? What is our confidence in the testing methods? They were asking the researchers. They were asking other utilities. They were asking the North Carolina Department of Environmental Resources the same questions. And there were no answers. Uh, there was a lot of effort put in through late 2016, early 2017 to find answers um, and many times the answers were, we don't know. And that 
uh, continued until the publishing of an article in uh, June of 2017 in a local newspaper detailing the uh, published paper. And at that point, public concern and a, a demand to address this public, this perceived pro problem overtook the regulatory framework that was in place to address it. You mentioned that PFAS and, and these other, you know, parts of that forever chemical family are really prevalent because of household products, consumer goods. Um, in the case of the Cape Fear River and this utility, what was the source of, of that contaminant in the water? So that was part of the, the, the conversation after the report was issued. Why and where are these chemicals coming from? And it became pretty clear that there was a manufacturer of PFOS chemicals, a, 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 actually a campus about 55 miles upstream of our community's intake. That uh, is the, um, what is now called the Fayetteville Works uh, uh, site. At the time, um, and for many years, that site was owned and operated by DuPont and others who joined DuPont on the site. Um, sometime in the 2015 time frame, uh, that, that uh, company spun off three others. And the company responsible for dealing with this issue and responsible for the discharges became Kim Ors. So in the summer of 2017, when it becomes public that there are these levels of Gen X and you know, PFAS in the Cape Fear River and in the water of this utility, um, there's a lot of response that has to happen at that point. What did you all do from a technical standpoint? What could be done with the water? What did you do with testing, reporting numbers to the public? I'm just curious how a utility operates on that, you know, in that sphere. The utility began testing for Gen X in 2017 themselves, trying to understand, all right, what is, what is coming into our source water? And um, as an interesting side note, uh, the ability to identify these individual chemical uh, uh, constituents, Gen X, expanded from one or two to today, we're monitoring 60 discrete PFAS compounds. We suspect that there are many, many more that we cannot discreetly monitor for. And uh, every uh, year, two or three compounds are refined and, and added to the testing list. Um, this utility uh, understood that it couldn't wait for the federal or state regulatory process to generate the answers that it needed. The, the community leaders, uh, the, com the customers themselves, were asking for some immediate action. So the utility chose to begin a crash course in analyzing and evaluating multiple treatment technologies to remove PFAS. I actually looked at uh, three treatment technologies, reverse osmosis, granular activated carbon, and ion exchange resins. This utility, uh, after this pilot testing program, decided to land on granular activated carbon as its solution set, GAC. And it makes a lot of sense for this utility in particular. Um, this treatment facility uh, utilizes uh, GAC in um, uh, filter, filtration now, and did at the time. And uh, with our particular mix of treatment and our intended uh, um, goals for discharge, a large new granular activated deep bed uh, facility was our obvious choice. Uh, talk about that investment. Uh, you know how much that that cost, uh, how long it took to bring that on. Um, I know that as a ratepayer, I think that I had you know kind of a five dollar a month charge added to my bill. I was have been happy to pay that. Uh, the clean water is worth it. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about the, the process of building that, the cost, and then what it's going to cost to continue operating that, maintaining it, what you have to do to keep that filtration uh, effective. Well, think about this. From 2017, when this utility was grappling with understanding what is, what is happening, 
uh, it, it had a period from 2017 to 2019 to decide, all right, how are we going to address this and design it? And by 2019, they're breaking ground on a new $43 million facility. Uh, this facility uh, would contain almost 3 million pounds of granular activated carbon. If we were going to put that in size perspective, it would just fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, and from 2019 to the time where we were able to activate the system in October of 2022, uh, the facility knew that, and the, and the people here knew that we needed to be doing something in the interim. So we took what I think was a, a prudent but unusual step of taking biologically active GAC filters and replacing them with GAC on a regular basis. So we had 14 filters at the facility, and um, those 14 filters received fresh, refreshed, granular activated carbon every year on a seven and seven uh, basis. You know, every six months, about half will be replaced. Uh, that was about a one and a half million dollar investment every year just to bridge from the discovery period to the uh, time when the dedicated deep bed facility would go online. And that helped to knock down the, the Gen X and PFAS levels, um, take, take those down a little bit. About 40 percent on average. Okay. The new facility was designed to be greater than 90. Uh, right now, we are at or near no detection. Um, the facility's been online six weeks. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to gloss over that point there, right? You, you brought this, this $43 million granular activated carbon system online, and you are, you're not detecting uh, these contaminants. That's right. Yeah. At or near non-detection is where we're at, but um, we're, we're going to have to establish as a facility um, what is going to be our change-out protocol? There's no regulatory guidance. There's even limited health advisory guidance. And we're in the middle of determining what that will be, what's best for our community. We have scheduled or programmed a, uh, a, a, a replacement schedule that would uh, be somewhere in the 270 to 340 time frame, depending on the what we're seeing in the river. A lot of our schedule is driven by how much pollution still is released from the Kimors facility and the, the watershed that it contaminated. But if we're, if we're in the 270 to 340 time frame, you know, we're anywhere from three to $5 million worth of granular activated carbon replacement and regeneration a year. That's a substantial investment in cost and operation going forward. Let's get us a little bit technical and wonky here. So th that, that granular activated carbon, you mentioned the word rejuvenation there. So some people would be like, oh, you get this stuff, then you gotta just throw it away, and what about this whole waste chain? So what happens actually uh, to refresh those filters? What's, what's that whole process? We're still in the process of deciding that very thing. Should we replace a filter that is exhausted with new virgin material? or should we seek to regenerate it, to send it to another facility where they will drive out the contaminants, and in that process, they'll, they'll exhaust 10, 15% of that material in place, so they'll have to make that up with uh, virgin GAC and return it to us. And right now, we've, we've programmed in, our plan is, yeah, we're gonna attempt regeneration. And um, our partner in this, is Calgon Carbon, and they have facilities in Ohio and in New York. And when we exhaust our first set of filters, we've got eight new deep bed filters. Uh, we will be uh, exchanging those for regenerated carbon. We'll be, set, we'll be taking it out, sending it out to be regenerated, and then returning it to the facility. The facility, though, is designed to attempt regeneration in place. It's designed uh, to uh, look at alternative uh, treatment technologies. So if we later determine that uh, MIAX is a, is a uh, more appropriate, cost-effective um, uh, material, then the facility can take that in. I, I, for a 
crash course in solving a problem. I'm really amazed by how much thought was put into making sure that this would address these issues going forward. And then, of course, we're partnering with, with academia to test even newer materials. We still have a, our pilot plant that we built to uh, understand where we needed to land, and we made that available to researchers at NC State and UNC Chapel Hill and other locations. And they're bringing in um, what I would call exotic uh, materials that are designed to improve the removal efficiency. And we're testing them at this location. With this all, the news broke in July of 2017. Through now, what happened with actual water consumption? You know, my instinct would tell me that people stopped using, you know, using their water and, and consumption went down. But what, what happened? So I'll, I'll reflect it back to you. What are the major uses of water in your home? Is, I mean, I'm a water insider, so I have some knowledge that the appliances, right, like mm -hmm. the washing machine, right. the dishwasher, those are big users, your toilet, outdoor irrigation, if you're, you know, your public water's hooked up to that, those are big ones. Toilets. Toilet. Yeah. Consumption of water, you know, drinking of water, relatively small part of your home usage, and that's true across our service area. So we didn't see a decline. We actually have seen a continuous increase from the advent of this issue and before to today, about 2% a year. And I would attribute that to the fact that this is a growing community. Um, but we didn't notice a decline. I wanted to ask, um, before we move on to some other stuff, what's it like? You've been in, in the water sector for a while, right? Working in utilities. Um, what's it like being at a utility that is at the forefront of this issue, right? I imagine that you are talking with colleagues around the country. There's a lot of eyeballs on places like Wilmington. How do they deal with this contamination? How do you deal with this problem? Um, just as a, as a you know, water professional, as a utility professional, you've been here just as the director of this for 18 months, so not the whole time. But what's it, what's it, what's it like? Um, is there that exchange happening with others out there in the profession? And you know, is, are there lessons learned from here that are being shared? A lot, of, a lot of questions there, but I think you absolutely. See where I mean, uh, you know, one, one, one of the unusual things that uh, we're wrestling with is we are at the forefront of this topic, and our staff have become subject matter experts, at least in the eyes of others, and certainly in my eyes. When I joined this organization, I was just amazed by the depth and breadth of talent that was here dealing with this problem. Um, they wrestled in some dark days with trying to understand and come up with solutions. And now they are traveling and partnering with our uh, professional organizations, with AWWA, with AMWA, with NACWA, sharing that information. And we've got people that come and visit us and speak to us about our solution sets weekly. So uh, let's shift to the legal slash regulatory front. We met, you know, it was discussed that, that this Gen X and PFAS family came from that Camorras facility that's up the Cape Fear River. Uh, what, what actions were pursued or taken by, by this utility uh, to try to address that source of pollution, to try to hold that source of pollution responsible? The leaders of this utility asked Camorras to address the problem uh, on our behalf. And ultimately, um, we were forced to go to federal court to demand that uh, Kim Orr's, uh, address the problem on our behalf. And I will say to Kim Orr's credit, they are doing work on their site to try to reduce the pollution that continues to leave their site. But there's 40 years plus of atmospheric deposition, water discharge, um, and that pollution remains. And we have expended now uh, the $43 million facility that you're in today, other expenditures such as the change out program in the existing filters, uh, testing of groundwater. So there's groundwater contamination also. We're close to $50 million of expenditures with another $60 million on the horizon in terms of operation. And we're asking in court for Kim Orris to be responsible for those costs. Um, and we've litigated this now for four, almost five years. And 
We are just in the discovery phase. So like any litigation, it'll take a long time to work towards a solution. Uh, we believe at the end of the day that a court will find Kim Orr's and its sister companies were responsible for the costs that we've had to endure. Um, and they will hopefully reimburse us at full cost for what we've spent. But until then, we have to take action. We have to pay for it now. And you and I are both ratepayers in this community. Um, we saw our first rate increase in four years, about $5.39. It was an 8.5% rate increase. 70% of that was solely attributable to Kimmel's. We actually broke a 13% rate increase over two years. So we have another eight and a half next year. Again, 70 some percent of that is attributable to the cost imposed by Kimmel's and pollution from Kimmel's. When this situation, again, uh, I'm really focused on how a utility responds to, to being at the center of a PFAS contamination situation. How do you work with those state regulators and those federal regulators? This is something of a narrative of somebody who's coming in 18 months in on a five-year process. But my observation was the relationship in the beginning was challenging at best. Um, there was a negotiated consent order between Kim Ors and the state and an NGO that this utility was excluded from. And our solutions to our costs were not included in that consent order. So this utility litigated that. I litigated for a number of years to become part of the consent order. Ultimately, we were not successful. So I would say that that, that frosted the relationship for a while. Um, to the credit of the department, they were looking and still continue to look towards solutions. Last summer, so that's the summer of 2021, uh, Secretary Elizabeth Beiser was appointed to oversee that department. And uh, she's coming in with fresh eyes, and she also has be the benefit of three or four years of research uh, that was generated that her predecessor didn't have. And she, she looks at the problem and decides that um, there needs to be a new take. Uh, in November of 2021, for example, uh, she, her administration uh, found that uh, the consent order should be extended beyond its current, uh, or what was at the time, its current range, to encompass our community, our county, New Hanover County and others, because there was groundwater contamination that uh, research had demonstrated was clearly attributable to Kim Orr's. So that changed the nature of the relationship. And we've been working quite closely uh, with the department over the last 18 months to, again, to the credit, I think, of the department and to its new leadership um, who had the advantage of new and, and deeper information. And there's a PFAS roadmap that the department has developed uh, that I encourage you and others to look into, uh, which will hopefully one day lead toward to research that establishes reference doses for chem or specific chemicals. So keep in mind, this is a Southeast North Carolina issue. Many, if not most of the chemicals we're dealing with don't appear anywhere else in, in North America at least. So the regulatory process of the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, research leading to reference doses, leading to health advisory levels, leading to water quality standards and MCLs and drinking water, none of that will likely occur for these chemicals unless the state chooses to do those things. And that was laid out in the roadmap from Secretary Beiser. So the state is going to attempt to help establish for this family of chemicals specific to our region of the nation um, reference doses, and if possible, health or preliminary health goals, health advisory levels, and if we can from there, water quality standards, both for surface water and groundwater, and uh, drinking water standards. And as a utility, we need those things. 
Otherwise, what is our goal in terms of treatment and treatment technology? So much of what we do in the water business is aligned with the, the goals and objectives, the MCLs that, are, that come out from EPA. Very few states generate their own. And, and that's our yardstick or measurement of success for the, in the industry. Here, we have none. So we're trying to develop that at a local level, and we're asking our state partners to refine that statewide. In the five years since this has all kind of come out, there's been a lot of community activity, a lot of organizations getting involved, uh, you know, Riverkeeper, uh, the, the Cape Fear or River organizations and, and others. How does a utility uh, interact with them? How, how you know, what, what comes of that? What's the benefit? Um, yeah, what are those relationships like? I was heartened and encouraged when I joined this organization to see how closely this utility was working with the nonprofits in this sector. Uh, you know, the, the environmental advocacy NGOs, uh, some of which are on a national level, a few of which were created in response to this crisis. And um, there, there's utility staff that work uh, weekly, uh, communicate monthly, on a re more regular basis with uh, those nonprofits in terms of communication, uh, transparent information of what we're seeing, uh, joint efforts to educate the, the community at large, to influence legislation, to influence permitting associated with Camores. It's what I would consider a very healthy relationship between the water sector in this part of the state and the nonprofit community that uh, it serves. Those healthy relationships, that collaboration is beneficial to the utility then. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd encourage any utility, and I think this is a best practice. I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that this is a best practice that I have uh, heard at our conferences with, with WEFTEC and others to directly engage your nonprofit community, no matter what the topic is, when there's an overlap between that nonprofit and the water sector. And you know, we apply those best practices here, and I think we've successfully built some relationships that then we could use to address the regulatory drivers that will come in the future. The rate payers, the consumers, the, the people that, that get your water to their homes and businesses and schools and churches, uh, you know, you mentioned that when the story came out, there a lot of concern arose, and understandably. Um, what, what has that been like? Uh, what has the relationship with, with the ratepayers been like? Uh, how has that evolved? Again, you've been here 18 months, this goes back five years, but what's, what's been that story? Well, as you can imagine, there was a, a public trust crisis. I would say it wasn't generated by the staff here, but it's a reality that there were some concerns. Uh, and, that, and those concerns led this utility and its leadership to say, we're going to take immediate action. And um, the, that immediate action was we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna rebuild trust through transparency. We're going to tell you exactly what we're doing. We're going to publish every bit of information that we gather in, that we have confidence in. Uh, we're going to engage you more. We're going, to t we're going to go out in the community and tell you what's going on and ask your opinion. We're going to advocate on your behalf. The, the, the polluter here is the one who's imposed a burden on the community, the people we serve, our customers. And it's our job to go and advocate on their behalf and defend their rights. So that's litigation. That is public pressure campaigns. That is engagement in the General Assembly of North Carolina seeking solutions. That's engagement in the administration realm in terms of working with Secretary Beiser and others for uh, additional testing and development of reference doses and development of regulations. It's engagement in terms of NPDES permits for uh, the upstream facility that is, that is the polluting neighbor. Um, those are the things that we are trying to do to demonstrate to our customer base that we're going to reach a solution. And I think I've observed in my limited time here that those actions are paying off. 
They were occurring before I joined the organization. They continued after I joined the organization. And there's a lot of appreciation that I have personally heard from the community that this utility has taken the stance to try to address this issue and to ensure the people who are responsible for it, the polluter, Kim Ors, pays for it. I guess one of the biggest things you have now is this, this finished water that's coming out of those granular activated carbon filters that is so much cleaner, right? Uh, you know, non-detect of, of Gen X and PFAS. Um, how is that critical to rebuilding public trust in their water? And how do you go about getting people to understand that that's the water coming out of their taps now? It's a public communication campaign. Uh, it's branding in terms of uh, reintroducing ourselves and our product. Um, I think that our team has come up with some pretty clever approaches. Uh, the, the one that we use the most is this is a clearly better time for us, clearly better Cape Fear. Um, and we're using that, uh, that type of communication in um, commercials on local television, uh, in community outreach and direct uh, meetings, myself and others. If, I, if we can gather five folks together to, who will take five or ten minutes to listen about our story and what we're doing, we'll go and we'll go meet with those folks. It's, um, it's asking our local um, water users to be part of the messaging reaching out to the Craft Brewers Alliance and others and saying, hey, come visit us. Let us show uh, you our product and our, and our facility, and let's partner together to communicate that message to your customers. It's reaching out to the local realtors and saying, hey, we have a great message here. We have a product that people want to come and see. And working with the local business development community and saying, come look at this new product that we have. Let's market us as a location to go to for high water use in, uh, industries, uh, for quality water use industries, because we're, we're working in the realm of designer water now. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> well, like I said, I'm part of this community so, and, and work in water, so it's been fascinating uh, for me to follow this for the, for the past five years. Uh, that public awareness piece, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'm out at sports on the sideline of soccer games or basketball games uh, or out uh, at a restaurant or something and, and I hear people that don't have the story right about the water. So, I, you know, I, I try to do my part and, and let people know uh, what's going on, even on social media too. Like, uh, we all have to kind of get that info out there. but. Yeah, Ken, thank you very much. You're in the water loop. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And special thanks to Black & Veatch, PFASCOMS.com, and Ultra for the support of this series. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org.